So I think we're live now. So um, uh, namaste, everybody. Greetings. Uh, uh, welcome back to uh, our conversations at Charter for Change. Charter for Change at Jiva Mukti Yoga is a social justice platform uh, where we bring in amazing people around the world who are doing amazing things to change our world for the better. Um, my name is Hari, Hari Mulukutla. I'm the CEO of Jiva Mukti Global, and it's my honor to host this panel discussion on um, humans and animals. And uh, we're going to be meeting shortly uh, an amazing expert from uh, Kampala, Uganda, Dr. Gladys um, Kalema Zikusoka. I hope I got that right. <laughs> uh, but we're going to call you Dr. Gladys, uh, which, is, which is easy for us. Um, it's wonderful to have you. Uh, here, and I'll talk about you briefly in a moment, and then also to welcome um, uh, your fellow panelist, who's uh, uh, our good friend, J-Mac, from South Africa, from Cape Town, uh, who's a Jiva Mukti Yoga teacher, a very uh, avid uh, vegan chef, a vegan activist, animal rights activist, and a environmentalist, uh, and he's just an exciting guy. He's a filmmaker, uh, he made the Jiva Mukti Yoga film that made the, quite a stir back in the day, a few years ago. Uh, we still love watching the film. It's broadcast all over the world, including in China and Russia with subtitles. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so Dr. Gladys, um, you know, you're an amazing um, activist and uh, you're, so Dr. Gladys uh, Zikusoka is a uh, founder CEO of an organization called Conservation Through Public Health, you know, which is interesting. It sounds like a unique concept for those of you who don't know what it is and we'll hear more about it. Um, and our conversation will try to connect the principles of yoga uh, and the principles of veganism, uh, the principles of animal rights and how they connect with some of the great work uh, Dr. Gladys has been doing in uh, Uganda. Um, you know, obviously, for uh, if you want to know more about it, you should go to the website. Mm -hmm. Just type conservation through public health uh, in the search engine, and you'll find the website link where you'll see uh, the extraordinary connection that she has made with uh, uh, trying to improve the lives of gorillas. But really, it has something to do with the humans that live near there and their good health and their well being reflects immediately on the well being of the animals, right? Of course. It sounds like genius, but it's a simple concept until you know it. <laughs> so uh, it's very exciting. And um, so I'll start with you then, Dr. Gladys. I mean, you've been uh, highly acclaimed. You've, you are a recipient of so many awards from so many international organizations. You're highly recognized. Uh, you're most recently, you've been a National Geographic Explorer. Um, what is it that is unique about what you're doing in um, actually the Bubindi National Park and the area there that is so unique that the entire world is looking at you and thinking, hey, this is a model that we want to learn and, and we need to bring that over, you know, all over the place where conservation is a challenge. Uh, so what would you say to that? Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Harry, for this program. Um, I would say that that's what our work is really unique is because we're looking at disease between people and animals. Most people look at disease coming from animals to people, which is commonly known as zoonosis. Yeah. And it's a word that more and more people have become familiar with during the COVID-19 pandemic. But we also look at disease coming from people to animals. And I think that that's what makes us unique. We've been focusing a lot on what you call reverse zoonosis. Correct. And right. that's what has made us unique. And um, this happened um, when, I, when I started working as the first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And we had a scabby skin disease outbreak in the then critically endangered mountain gorillas, which mm -hmm. was traced to people living, it came from people living around the park who have very little health care. Gorillas often go outside the park to eat people's banana plants when they become habituated for tourism or research which means that you can get close to them without them running away. Um, and then because there's so much human population growth, their forest habitat has been shrinking. And now they started to go back to areas where they used to range before. And I think that's where they got the scabies. They, they came across dirty clothing. 
and the baby gorilla died and the rest only recovered when we treated them um, with ivermectin. And so that made me realize that, made us realize that you can't protect the gorillas without thinking about their human neighbors right. and especially the health of their human neighbors. And so people getting used to the fact that, you know, we can also make animals sick. It's not only animals that can make us sick. It's probably what makes our work unique. Right. And so at Conservation through Public Health, we generally improve the health of the people and animals together, the people, the wildlife, the livestock together. And we also improve community livelihoods and well-being. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's always uh, we learn something new every day. And now what you're talking about, it's always the humans, isn't it? You know, we go and mess with nature and animals and all of a sudden we're like, oh, my God, the world is going to an end. And then there's COVID and now we have to deal with it. And uh, this is something that's very close to our heart. You know, we care deeply about animals. And, you know, frankly, if you ask uh, other activists, even JMAC, you said that earlier, just leave them uh, alone and it'll be so much easier. So I want to ask you another question and then we can uh, pivot the conversation a little bit. You know, what do you think about the guerrilla tourism? You know, I'm uh, guilty of having been one. I've actually been to the Rwanda uh, a park where there were gorillas. You know, I went the whole, we did the trek, you know, five miles in the forest, all the mosquitoes were biting us, but it was exciting, you know, to see them. It was absolutely amazing. You know, everybody was just screaming. But at the same time, I felt like, we are going to watch the gorillas and it's a form of a entertainment and it felt wrong, but I, I was a little torn with that whole concept. I know that gorilla tourism also raises a lot of money to, you know, to help with the local uh, economy. I think there's always two or three sides to the conversation. Um, what, what, is your, what is your personal thought on that? Um, it would be nice to know. Yes, um, guerrilla tourism, I would say tourism could be a necessary evil, <laughs> if that's what you want to call it, yeah. because people need to benefit from living next to gorillas. As long as they are not benefiting, it's very hard for them to coexist with the gorillas and other ones. Oh, I think we... Uh... We may have lost Dr. Gladys um, for the moment. Well, first of all, it's actually a miracle to even connect like this online from three different continents. And uh, absolutely, yeah, and then we take it for granted. But so, so Jay, maybe you want to weigh in on what I was talking about earlier? Uh, can you sure. tell us a little bit about what you think or what you've learned in your journey uh, from the gorilla side of things, or? No, what from is, just the whole conservation particular. through um, mm -hmm. public health. You know, the idea sounds so uh, obvious, but then nobody knows about it until you, uh, until you do, you know? Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, even here in South Africa, we've, our large part of our tourism um, is made up of game farms and right, right. For, foreigners coming to visit uh, the game farms to see the animals so it's it's a it's an interesting one because we need to feed our people but at the same time uh, <laughs> yeah we're gaining and we shouldn't really be in their habitat so it's always a difficult conversation but I see Dr. Gladys is back now yeah 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 I think we lost you Dr. Gladys can you uh, hear us maybe there's a connection problem still Yeah. So, I mean, from my side, my point of view as a South African and uh, being around the animals all the time in my immediate vicinity here in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, I think it has its place that um, if, if it's conserved well and they're doing their best to keep the animals in a place as far removed from humans uh, with as little impact from human beings, I think it has its place in our economy um, because it won't go away. It will just progress into a worse situation, perhaps into bad zoos and things like that where the animals aren't looked right, after properly. Right. Yeah, worse. So I think yeah. it has its place and that's, it makes it worse. So we just need to find that, that good place for the animals at least. And um, the people that benefit from it are those communities. So it's always a, 
a challenging one. And Dr. Gladys could probably give us a lot more rundown on the communities that benefit from it and are trying their best to conserve. Yeah, when we were, uh, you know, went to the game park, we, you know, it was it was not cheap. You know, we had to pay cash, I think three or four hundred dollars. <laughs> so we went to the ATM to get the money and and paid it. That, oh, but it's going for a good cause. You know, you could see how they proved to you that they're keeping it really clean and well um, uh, supported and it supports the, uh, you know, all of the people who work there in the park. So there's two sides to it. So. Um, so if Dr. Gladys, if your connections ho holds, uh, well, again, I see the picture being f a little frozen. So um, uh, maybe, maybe yeah, Is, shall we try again? Yeah, we, we to, to continue your thought. Okay, um, I hope this is a bit better, um, my, my network. Uh, the, as, as you just mentioned, Jay, that um, the money from tourism goes to support the local communities. And so in Uganda, 20% of the park entry fee and $10 from every gorilla permit goes to support the local community. And this helps, in, this helps them to develop along with the park operations. And so for example, they can write projects and as long as the projects benefit more than just one family, they can get funded and this really enables them to coexist with the gorillas. They're seeing the gorillas as their future. But even then, when you're going to the gorillas, I, I don't know if you saw that when you, Harry, when you're in Rwanda, that you porters come and help you to carry your luggage. And yes. even if you're going up there and you feel, ah, I'm fit, I don't need a porter, but the porters, you're supporting the local economy. Right. And also yeah. the porters are helping you to prevent you falling or slipping down and falling, um, pulling you up when you're tired. Sometimes the gorillas are very far away. But the most important thing is, as long as you're putting, helping the porters to cope, they're supporting other members of their family, there's less need for them to enter the park to poach. And sometimes you may find the porter's father is a poacher or a former poacher, and as long as his son is bringing money in, he won't go into the forest. Right. And so these are all the different ways that we try and support the community. We also have a um, gorilla conservation compensation enterprise where we uh, support the communities I'll bring that up later, but we support the communities bordering the park and make right. sure that they are getting a livelihood from coffee. You know, right. often when I'm crossing the park to go to the gorillas, I come across, you know, coffee farmers and they sometimes talk about it during the tour to the gorillas. And I found out the one getting a steady market or a fair price. So mm -hmm. these are, with all these things, we find that we have to keep supporting the local communities. Right, I found that link fascinating, the connection between coffee and the gorilla conversation, uh, conservation. And I looked more into it and I thought that was a great way of uh, supporting a legitimate lifestyle and uh, economy. You know, everybody loves coffee, or at least a lot of people love coffee all over the world. So mm -hmm. that's, that's an easy win if we can get sustainable coffee, you know, without all the chemicals and the artificial processing and the pesticides and all that good stuff. Um, so then... Um, you know, we saw actually this a gorilla, you know, was an alpha male. Right? I, they told us there were 18 different families that he was making sounds to check on all of them every few minutes, but he just ignored the humans. And as you were mentioning earlier, there was a porter. We had actually an armed guard. And I was joking with him. I said, is, there, is the gun for, uh, for humans who will misbehave when they get close to the gorilla? And he had a big laugh. <laughs> <laughs> that's that was my concern that people are going to freak out as they get close to the gorilla because it was a very really, uh, exciting time and the gorilla had babies jumping all over on the trees and he was eating um all these branches he was chomping down we went at his lunchtime and i thought oh we're we shouldn't be here now you know um so i i want to ask you you know i'll uh, so, so this thing in um in our yoga philosophy we, for us at Jiva Mukti Yoga, for all our teachers and students, you know, it's a very basic concept of looking at it in a holistic way, everything, right? You cannot isolate the problem of gorilla conservation, just look at the animals. And as you did in your life experience, looking at the humans and the village and the entire population. So in the yoga world, it's just a holistic way of doing it. Because when you try to find a solution that's fragmented and isolated, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And then you waste a lot of time in our friend. You go back and look, oh, of course, we have to look at the people and their health. So that to us uh, actually uh, actually resonates very well. 
So I want to ask Jay, and I'll bring you in. What do you think, um, obviously, what you're doing, you know, you've started a sort of a, rev, um, a revolution of vegan food in South Africa and Cape Town. Uh, your your amazing book, um, Kind Kitchen, looks fantastic. Even when you look at the pictures, you look, you know, you will get hungry. I'll promise you, <laughs> everybody. I recommend that book very much. But if you had to explain to someone, there you go, and then flip the <laughs> cover, the Kind Kitchen, by the way, guys. Um, uh, I uh, I want to ask you, uh, how do you? Well, what would you? How would you respond when you talk about conservation through the food industry? And you know, obviously, it will. You know, it will uh, prevent all the factory farms from being so sure. bad for the environment. Yeah. Well, I, I guess the, the first thing that I always look at uh, as a chef is, as we're going in this world now, it's got to be uh, seasonal, it's got to be local, and as much as possible, we try and use all of these things. And this is not a new concept. And it's a concept that I think is gaining momentum worldwide um, as we move forward post-COVID um, to really dig deep and go, Let's get to the grassroots of why grains such as sorghum in South Africa and Uganda even um, is super popular and um, how do we use it for the benefit of our own needs in, in our countries because it's obviously grown here, it's, it's supporting locals, it's conserving. As soon as we start to look at uh, crops that are not from our regions, it starts to tear up the infrastructure of the lands. Uh, it starts to, the insects and the birds and all the animals that go with the lands in our various countries don't understand what to do with this thing anymore. And maybe it's a bit of an alien species. So I think that's the first thing as all of us can do. And Sharon and David always say it, it's like the best thing that we can do as cons conservationists or environmentalists is to look at what we're putting on our plates at least three times a day. And it, it really does resonate constantly through mm -hmm. my mind as, as a chef and a father myself, as, as right. a dad. You know, um, you know, before I had Flynn, my baby boy, well, his mom had him, obviously, but <laughs> I was there. <laughs> but constantly I'm thinking for the future of my, my child and um, what that future will look like. Of course. And, and I hope that future looks like something that doesn't have all these doomsday tokens and headlines that are going with it at the moment that we, we need to reach a certain point within the next 10, 20 years. Otherwise, we're doomed. Let's hope that's not going to happen. Absolutely. We all have to, we have to play our part. And, and playing our part means buying local, uh, just educating yourself a lot more on what's available and, and obviously buying the produce that helps your local communities, organic, all of these things. So from my side, that's what I would say. And um, yeah, I guess uh, abos, <laughs> abos have their place, but you've got to use them where necessary and when they're in season. Mm -hmm. I, I uh, hear you, man. I'm also a newly minted father like you, and it changes your perspective completely about the future and what we're doing to the planet and what the answers are. And I, but I also find it gratifying that some of the young people are a lot more practical and it's natural for them to think about climate change. You know, unlike the, unlike the hippies I was saying to you in the phone earlier, you know, it was yeah. a big deal when they did it because it was so new and so actually revolutionary, but now it's not. So it's, it has to be done. It's a survival mechanism for the future. Uh, generations. Um, so that's what I think. So, um, you know, uh, so going back to Dr. Gladys, while we have her, <laughs> when the connection holds, I want to use the um, opportunity, you know, obviously, because of the pandemic, now there's a lot of health experts that say that we are, um, uh, it's just a matter of time. It's not a matter of if that the next pandemic will come, you know, either from animals or from humans going back to animals. You know, we saw some horrible stuff about the mink being killed because one mink, you know, one of them had COVID and now how, you know, they, they had to call millions of them or something in uh, Europe. You know, it's, it's really strange that the human population, we don't do anything until sometimes it's too late. 
So what would you say to that? What would you say that we should be doing now What if we learned anything from COVID um, that will hopefully decrease the chances that we would have such a severe pandemic once again that would destroy both humans and animals? Oh, oh, you're on mute. I, we don't hear you. I would say that right now we have to it really increased awareness of these links between people and animals, human health, animal health, and the environment. And that's one big way because that's what will change people's behavior. Mm -hmm. It's a result of our behavior that we're having these pandemics. And so awareness is very, very important. Um, and then, you know, people go on to realize that it's dangerous to eat bush meat. You know, you could easily pick up something which could spread everywhere. And also, it's very easy for us to make animals sick, you know, whether it's great apes we are closely related to, if we're visiting them, we cough on them and make them sick. Oh, it's animals like mink. A lot of animals in captivity have got COVID, like gorillas in captivity, lions, tigers, mink, you know, on mink farms because of the very close contact with their handlers. So a disease can jump from animals to people, spread very quickly among people because we're very close to, together. We can easy, we're super spreaders and then can jump back from people to the animals that we're working with, that we're handling. And so all the ways that people can do to understand that, then they're more likely to prevent this happening again in the future through their behavior. But also things like, you know, not cutting down trees when you don't have to, reducing on deforestation, respecting nature, um, making sure that you, you, you're trying to keep your environment as healthy as possible is very important. Animal welfare, is another thing, you know, if you're gonna have animals in a, in a market, you know, chickens or even wild animals, for example, some people farm wild animals, do it in a way that you're taking into account their welfare. But even more importantly, don't farm animals that are likely to, to carry diseases or, you know, to be hosts of diseases or sources of diseases. And, you know, try and get them out of the food chain because it, it's going to affect everybody eventually and things are gonna go out of hand. Like the pandemic has brought down economies. This hasn't just been a health issue, it's become a huge economic issue um, in all respects, you know, travel stopping, tourism stopping, and so many other businesses closing or having to not be able to employ people. Everybody suffered because of this. So we just need to respect nature more, you know, as Jay mentioned, you know, healthy eating is very important. Um, responsible consumption, you know, like for example, with gorilla conservation coffee, this coffee is sustainably produced. It comes from farmers who would otherwise be destroying the forest, the habitat of the gorillas or poaching in their habitat. They may not even be eating gorillas, but they can eat daika or bush pig and gorillas get caught in snares. And even this daika or bush pig could make them sick. So all that stuff of, you know, making sure that it's all along the value chain, the farmers are getting a good price for good coffee, for not going into the forest. And a donation goes back to support the health and conservation work of conservation through public health. So it's it's like what, when people are going to eat things, they should be asking, you know, buy things, whether it's coffee, tea, or anything in the supermarket. Right. Was this produced sustainably? Did right. the animals suffer? Did was is was it organically produced? I think there needs to be that wave is actually that movement of people who are conscious, more conscious about what they're eating, having responsible consumption really needs to improve. And I think the pandemic has brought a lot of awareness about this issue, responsible travel, responsible consumption. I think all of this is going to enable or prevent the likelihood of a, another pandemic coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's fantastic. Absolutely, everything you said. In fact, um, uh, you know, just a quick question about the coffee. Is that something we can buy online just uh, uh, directly from the source or is that distributed here in the West, for example, in the US and Europe? How can we get that coffee, the, uh, actually the uh, Gorilla coffee? Yes, we can buy it online. Um, it can be bought uh, in, if you go to our website, gccoffee.org, you can buy it online. Um, in UK, it's at Money Row Beans. And in US, there's gccoffeeusa.com. Oh, okay. You can buy it online and also in other countries, in New Zealand and Australia and Kenya, in Safari uh -huh. Lounge, in the supermarket. You can find it in the high-end supermarkets and at the airports. 
Um, I just said and, in, and in Uganda, it's available as well. But the online consumption is mainly in the uh, UK and the US and New okay. Zealand can buy it online. <laughs> Decent copy USA.com, right? Yeah, fantastic. Yes. Okay, yeah. I think uh, I'm I'm gonna try it for sure. <laughs> That'll be my next yes, time. Yes, you should. Yeah, because it, it <laughs> means a lot. You know, we actually at uh, Juba Mukti, we talk about conscious consumerism, you know, responsible consumption, exactly what you said. We have the same concept when we try to buy things or sell things. We want to make sure where it comes from, you know, because it feels good when you know where it comes from. Um, you know, I was, uh, I was just going to ask J-Mac, you know, how he feels about, you know, you talk about local uh, stuff, you know, to buy food locally. You know, it's very odd. Even now you go to the supermarket and you find I don't know, kiwis from New Zealand and blackberries from Chile. I mean, it feels crazy that you get all the fruits in all the seasons. You're not supposed to get mangoes in the winter, but there are mangoes <laughs> in the supermarket. And it just seems very odd. And, and what kind of, I mean, how can, we, how can we make sense of that? I mean, is there some sort of an education component that goes along with it? Like informing people and say, hey, don't buy this stuff because it's not... You know, because they're they will sell it if there's actually demand, right? That's what it boils down to. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's happening naturally, um, from what I've seen and noticed. Um, you know, most of the people that would visit our uh, restaurants uh, do understand these seasonal items and will stay away from the imported goods. Uh, but it really is a, a difficult situation that we find ourselves in as a species because even those imported goods are helping essentially those communities that it comes from, right? Um, you're helping in many ways, but also hurting in many ways. So I don't know if I really have the answer. I don't, that's, that's way above my pay grade. <laughs> but but um, there are things like fair trade and so many different sure. organizations that are doing that, right? Yeah. They're sure. talking about why. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But I, I, I do know from experience as a chef and uh, creating different dishes, I know that at least we're lucky enough here in South Africa, and I'm sure most of Africa, a lot of produce does grow very well here. We, we have started growing our own dragon fruit. Um, we've, we grow our own avocados, um, you know, in various parts of the country. Almonds, we grow here in Cape Town as well now. Uh, so it doesn't have to come from California to make almond milk, uh, mm -hmm. those sorts of things. So I think um, the more popular something becomes in a country, what I'm trying to get at is that maybe those farmers go, well, I'm actually going to start to grow that thing because right. it's very popular and it's going to help, you know, my economies of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it comes down to the other aspect of an environmental thing. Um, do the insects and animals understand what that new alien species is that's been grown. So I guess that's something more for Dr. Gladys to answer um, how that affects the, the environment. But um, definitely I think from what I've seen and how it's going in my own small sphere and, and circle, people are very aware of these things and are changing and trying their best. And um, even my local shops that I go to, I don't find certain fruits and uh, popular things that I would find all year round because people don't want them because they right. know the impact. So it's changing. Right. It is changing slowly. And if they do find it, it's in maybe a canned version, which is not as great, um, but they right. can. Right. It doesn't taste as well. Yeah. But at least it's maybe less harmful so that yeah. they're not shipped around the world and try, you, know, sure. you have to actually refrigerate it, send it on a ship, you know, thousands of miles and all of that. Um, yeah. Okay. Interesting. So, you know, uh, Dr. Gladys, you were mentioning earlier about bushmeat and I was, uh, I was, uh, quite stunned to hear about that when I learned something new from, um, uh, Jay, um, sorry, Jay, you know, when we we're talking about Kip Anderson's film, Sea C Spiracy, yeah. he talks yes. about that in the film where because of the, uh, because of the industrial scale fishing that depleted fish from the, from the oceans there, so the uh, people in uh, West Africa coast, they couldn't go and fish anymore for their livelihood because all the fish is gone. You've got these giant industrial trawlers trawling the ocean floors, killing dolphins and I don't know, sharks and all these exotic animals, which do, don't even know that uh, live there, destroying the environment. And these guys don't have anything to fish. 
So they're going inland into the forest and, you know, monkeys, and then that's where actually Ebola came from. So that's astounding that the global corruption of basically trawling fish and uh, depleting the ocean, not only did it have an impact on the environment, you know, they believe that climate change, one of the biggest contributors is the problems, you know, is the depleting fish in the oceans. Uh, now you see the uh, ripple effect on, on land and then a disease and that coming to the hum human. So it's, it's really, really crazy. Um, Caroline, someone, uh, anyway, never mind. Somebody was joining this Zoom. But by the way, this has been broadcast on YouTube and Facebook Live. If anybody has questions, please put them on, um, on uh, Facebook. Uh, we're here for another 10 or so minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. And uh, any of the panelists will answer the questions if you have any. So I'm going to look in the chat and see if there's any questions from anybody. Um, so Caroline just said that she posted the links for the coffee uh, on, on our Facebook. So a lot of people will uh, be able to try this. Gorilla Coffee will help the local community. It's sustainable, environmentally friendly. Um, that's good. And also uh, Caroline will post a link for uh, uh, the Kind Kitchen book as well. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's really, really great to have people like you in our um, community because uh, I know we inspire um, e each other. So, uh, so Jay, do you have any questions for uh, Dr. Gladys? What is the model there that you think we can bring and learn and implement in, in our areas and other areas of conservation? Because, you know, everybody knows about it. And I mean, if you just look at the awards that Dr. Gladys has achieved and the, actually the recognition is mind boggling. I mean, it's great. It's absolutely fantastic that people are able to learn that um, system. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I have two questions. One of them is uh, quite fluffy, uh, but maybe I'll start with that one. What, what, is the, <laughs> what is the ultimate plant milk that we could drink with your coffee if we came to visit you in Uganda? Uh, corn milk or what, what would the local plant-based milk be? That's, that's a good one. Ah, that's an interesting one. Uh, what, what's readily available? What's readily available? We don't actually have any plant-based milk in Uganda. See, yeah, at the moment, you need to get us some. <laughs> we can make we can make milk from sorghum, from millets. We can make it from corn. Yeah, Fantastic. we we can do some amazing things there. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess I guess my more important question was to really understand more about the process that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis to to understand what the real devastation is of human beings to the gorillas. Um, what does that entail? Could you uh, maybe just lay it out for me for someone that doesn't understand enough about all the great work that you do? Yeah, the, the real devastation, I guess I'd say is there's three sets of devastation. I would say that habitat loss is one of the biggest where people cut down trees, where the gorillas are found all over Africa. Um, and so wherever they are, their habitats are shrinking, which isn't good because even as we're trying to get the numbers to grow, for example, the mountain gorillas have almost doubled over the past 25 years from around 650 to just over a thousand. But still, even as they're growing, they don't have enough space to grow. So habitat loss is the biggest one. And the root cause is a high human population growth rate where, you know, there are too many people being born, the density is too high and people have no choice but to start cutting trees in order to support their large families. So they're not having manageable families and it's not reducing poverty in their home, it's increasing poverty in their home, which means that they have more mouths to feed and they still have to enter the forest to poach just to survive. Yeah. So poaching yeah. is another big issue. Um, like people set out snares to catch animals that they can eat. In uh, Uganda and Rwanda, people don't eat gorillas, so they're more like putting out snares for small antelope called daika or bush pigs. Okay, yeah. But in other countries, yeah. gorillas are considered a delicacy, so they oh. actually eat gorillas and they're part of the bushmeat trade. Um, and so crazy. that is a, big a form problem. of cannibalism almost. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's crazy. Yeah, it is. It's a it big is. problem. It is horrible. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a huge problem. But then disease, disease is the big one for us because, yeah. you know, we having discovered that people are making gorillas sick 
Um, yeah. It was a big thing that we needed to address urgently. And so we try our best to prevent disease between people and gorillas by working with community health workers, teaching them to do conservation work where they improve the health of the communities where gorillas range outside the park. But at the same time, they talk to people about having manageable families so they don't have to have large families and they can feed them and not have to enter the park to poach. But they also talk about the dangers of eating bushmeat and what that does to you and why they should farm sustainably so that they can have you know, enough food in an, and not with proper soil and water conservation. And so all of that is like a whole holistic package, mm. as Harry was saying, you know, a whole holistic package, which means that there's hardly any need for them to enter the forest and destroy the habitat of the gorillas. And so those are the main ways that it's happening, but it's all connected to having good community, adequate support to the communities, to their health, well-being, their livelihoods. They need to feel supported in order for them to support conservation mm -hmm. and, and, to support and, you, and to protect the gorillas. You, mm -hmm. What would you say the, the most sustainable farming item is in these communities now? Um, what, what would they be farming? As, yeah, as, actually coffee is a very good one because it's good, great for food security because you, know, you have to plant coffee trees with spaces. And in between the spaces, you can add, you know, you can put banana plants or avocado or, you know, so that people can eat at the same time as have the coffee. So it's fantastic for food security. But we're also teaching to people to do um, key, you know, small gardens, kitchen gardens, mm -hmm. um, because not everybody has a lot of land. Most people have very little land. But with kitchen garden agriculture, they can plant many different crops in a small space using proper soil and water conservation wow. and during covid actually after rafiki the lead silver buckle one of the gorilla groups was killed it was a huge shock mm -hmm. and though the poacher was put in jail for 10 years 11 years for killing this gorilla long the longest time anyone has ever been put in jail for killing a wild animal in uganda we knew that as long as there are hungry people like him around there's still going to be the temptation to go into the forest to poach and you know maybe more gorillas could get killed and so we started a program of providing fast growing seedlings to the most vulnerable communities around mm -hmm. the park. And it's done in a proper way. So we distributed 10 vegetables, which can grow fa very fast. And they were able to eat. They, a lot of them said they were poaching because they were hungry. But with yeah. the vegetables, which grew very fast on a small plot of land where we carried, we did it all organically, you know, encouraging them to use organic fertilizer, they're able to eat. And that means that even when tourism comes back, which is much part of the reason they were poaching, they don't have to have money from tourism to feed themselves. The money from tourism can go to support other areas like school fees for children, but they should be able to feed themselves without tourists, whether or not they're tourists, and in a sustainable way that doesn't destroy the, the soil where they are and doesn't destroy the habitat of the gorillas. Mm, amazing. Well, I mean, it's obvious, isn't it? You, if you ignore the plight of uh, people that don't have food, you know, what are they going to yes. do? You know, they don't have yeah. options. So then they'll do something that everyone's uh, actually horrified with. But then you have to solve the underlying problem. You have to go to the root, obviously. So um, I was just going to say, you know, Jay asked that fluffy question to you, Dr. Gladys, in the beginning, because this whole panel was actually just a conspiracy to turn you and your whole community vegan <laughs> and plant-based. But, but it, it, sounds, it sounds like they're pretty much vegan already. I mean, yeah, uh, they, the they are. you speak of and yeah, yeah so it's a meat's a luxury. Of course, I was going to propose that, uh, that J-Mac comes over to actually to Uganda and does a plant-based uh, food workshop and show everybody uh, and then link yeah. the amazing sorghum milk and millet milk and, you know, oat mm -hmm. milk oats, and then link it with the coffee. Uh, it will, it will turn it into a whole other thing, you know, and of course our entire Jiva Mukti Yoga vegan community will be after you wanting that coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would love to do, I would love to do that, but I'm definitely thinking I'm going to be learning a lot more from Dr. Gladys and, um, all of the people in those communities of how to produce some wholesome 
amazing vegan food. I mean, plantains is one of your crops that you use. It's, mm. it's not readily available here in South Africa, but I guess in America, you can get it quite easily. It's, it's part of, you know, Central American culture. So it's a lot easier. Yes. So these kinds of things I like to work with myself, but um, we don't get them very often. Um, so that would be fantastic to come and learn from you and your culture and your cooking and 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 impart some of my knowledge um, with you guys. But the work you're doing there is fantastic. So Thanks. hey, um, I'd love to learn about how all the different kind of milks that you can get from yeah. plants. Yeah, and, and, and making some some cheese from sorghum. Incredible. <laughs> Who would have thought? That would be so fantastic. <laughs> we can make some pizzas. You're making me hungry now. Um, so, <laughs> Doctor. So, both for both of you, there's a question uh, from social media. Uh, they're saying they're asking the question: Tips. Uh, what are the tips for everyday life worldwide? What small actions can we do uh, to conserve and balance? Uh, conserve and balance. Maybe they're talking about what is it that we could do in the in the Western world? You know, look. Most of us don't want to change our life, right? It's very few of us would want to compromise on our comforts and our conveniences. But regardless, if people are educated about, you know, what they can do, simple things, uh, maybe some incremental change can happen. So what would you say to that question? Or uh, maybe Dr. Gladys first and then Jay. Um, yeah, I can see <laughs> Adriana's put up the right, <laughs> what I was about to say, buy the coffee, buy Gorilla Conservation coffee, wherever you are, because by buying this coffee, you're helping to protect the endangered mountain gorillas and keeping people out of the forest who would otherwise be poaching and, you know, enabling them to have a sustainable livelihood outside the forest. Mm -hmm. So this is a very good way. <laughs> of supporting something simple you can do if you can't make it out to Uganda that's something simple you can do but something else that you could do is um, visit if you're able to if you're visit, able to visit come and be a responsible tourist post uh, images of yourself when you're wearing a mask when you're with the gorillas and you're safe distance from right. them right. and uh, sign the gorilla friendly pledge which one of our partners we're working with International mm -hmm. Gorilla Conservation Co Program put up and a tourist pledge, which we've been doing with. Uh, we have a whole uh, website we developed with the University of Exeter, which mm -hmm. is protectgreatapesfromdisease.com, which has lots of things that you can learn about as you're coming to visit. But it not only talks about preventing disease, but when you come, also buy a community craft, you know, take a porter along with you, find a way of giving back to the community, <laughs> including going on a gorilla conservation coffee safari as well. But just making sure that when you come, you're not just coming to see the wildlife, but you're also finding a way to support the communities because that makes a huge difference to the health and well-being and future of the gorillas and other wildlife. Um, something else you can do is you can come and volunteer with us, do research with us, mm -hmm. um, learn about our work. We also accept students who want to learn about our one health approach to conservation. Yes. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And, yeah. and I'm writing a book um, about my conservation journey. <laughs> and so when it comes out, you can buy the book and I'll keep in touch. I'll let you know when it comes out and you could share it with the listeners as well. <laughs> Talking about a lot of the things we are mentioning now, responsible consumption, responsible tourism, you know, preventing zoonotic disease, um, protecting wildlife and animal welfare and you know all kinds of things animal welfare and conservation human health and conservation and making sure that we're having sustainable models and holistic models that can enable us to have a better future for our planet <laughs> no this sounds wonderful this sounds fascinating i can't wait to go back i have been to uganda once before to Kampala, but I didn't go in to see any of the wildlife because I was working in the capital. But I, I will uh, propose to our team that maybe we do some sort of a yoga and conservation uh, trip. You know, I mean, the students and teachers, they would love it. You know, we could uh, learn a lot from each other. Um, so, uh, so Jay, what would you say to the questioner? I mean, obviously, you're actually implementing a lot of the stuff that we spoke about. Yeah, but I think what Dr. Gladys said, uh, spot on, uh, couldn't have said it any better. 
if you're coming to a country, support that country, just like you would want any tourist coming to your country to support the community and spread the word of what the issues are, you know? So um, Africa, we have, we still have a lot, a long way to go. Um, but I think Dr. Dr. Gladys said it best. And, um, you know, the book that she's writing, uh, as soon as that out, that's out, supporting that book, uh, perhaps there are people watching right now that can also give their support in other ways. You know, they, they're going up in their own environmentalist, um, they've got their own papers that they've written and they can, they can give their knowledge and, and go to Uganda and support or send some, some ideas. Mm -hmm. I mean, from my side, what I would do just listening to Dr. Gladys now is potentially, um, you know, send any kind of recipe I could to help you maybe, um, you know, support the communities. This is what we do in South Africa. If that's something that would be of any use, I'd be happy to share my knowledge. I would obviously <clears throat> be happy as a chef to come and share my support there and uh, at any time um, come and do these things and cook for you guys and, and learn with you all. But these are the things we have to do, I guess. It's, it's not a monetary thing. We have to share our knowledge. That's the only way that we're gonna progress as a species. Okay. Yes, definitely. And um, yeah, for more information, also visit our websites. I'd mentioned the coffee, but it's ctph.org um, and learn more about the work we're doing and how you can donate or just get involved in our work, you know, as a student or someone, or you have something that you can volunteer and offer, that would be fantastic. So all of that is on the website. <laughs> I actually also wanted to say that right now um, we are, Al Jazeera is featuring our work. So if you have it in your country, you can watch it, I think till midday tomorrow. It's going on for like a day. Um, talking about <laughs> oh my goodness, about, yeah, the, like politics, a three minute the politics. <laughs> oh, wow, incredible. So we are at the point where we have to look at the time and say, you know, unfortunately we didn't go into a lot of other issues. In fact, there was one thing you said, Dr. Gladys, I think you spoke about it or you wrote about it, I was reading about it a few days ago, how you connected gender um, equality to conservation. You know, you said that was a yes. basis actually. I thought, oh, that's a very profound thing to say. And uh, so maybe briefly, could you um, expand on that? And then we can end after that. And I wanna thank you both for coming to this wonderful panel, just to even meet you like this and learn more about what's happening in Uganda. I, I, I think a lot of, uh, of our community members will wanna come and see and learn from uh, what, what you're doing there actually. So I'll leave you, I'll give you the closing statement about gender equality and conservation, and then we will uh, uh, close this out. And then the recording will, by the way, be available um, on our uh, social media channels for people to watch afterwards. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for bringing up that very important point about gender equality. Unfortunately, in the conservation field, it's very skewed towards men. There's, you know, the percentage of men is much greater than women. And yet the problems um, of conservation are both created and can be solved by both men and women. So you need to involve the women as much as the men. And if you only have conversations with the men, you won't really address the whole issue. Mm -hmm. I can give an example of, you know, we had a meeting recently with reform poachers, um, talking to them about, you know, people not poaching in spite of tourists not being there don't backslide and go back to poaching. And in one of the meetings, there was, they, had, they brought their wives and we, their wives actually admitted that they encourage and pressure their husbands to go into the forest to get meat when they don't have food on the table. And so the fact that we're having both their wives in the meeting together with the men makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. It really makes a huge difference. Um, when I first started working like over 20 years ago, there were, there were no female rangers. But now the number of rangers is growing, 20% are women. It's mm -hmm. progress. We can still do better, but it's definitely a step okay. forward in the right direction. <laughs> and so we need to just get more and more women engaged, likely with our model of conservation through public health, because we're dealing with health, which is mainly a, a female issue, and conservation, which is mainly a male issue. We're finding that we're having 50% of our village health and conservation teams are men, and 50% are women. And so men are getting more involved in healthcare and family planning, and women are getting more involved in conservation and natural resource management. Mm -hmm. And they carry out Kapopia education to change 
their communities, visiting everyone in their village. And that is really making a difference. But also women leadership in conservation is even more rare, as you'd expect. Very few female leaders in conservation. And we are among the Leadership Council of Women for the Environment Africa, where we're trying to get more women in leadership positions in conservation, mentoring them. Because again, if you have more female leaders, then the issues that affect women and men in the communities where the precious wildlife is found, or even within the organizations you know, that they're running, will be more holistically addressed. So mm -hmm. it is very important to have an equal representation of men and women in conservation. So I was glad when you, you and women um, featured that work, that article on, on the International Day of Women and Girls in Science. We do need to have more women in the conservation space. I know other fields also don't have enough women, but conservation is one that really has had very few women. Conservation and natural resource management and environment in general. Absolutely. It brings a whole other level of perspective, compassion, and empathy into the conversation. And everybody knows what the impact of each other's uh, thoughts and you know how they do the work. So that's that's great. That's very, very good news from you. So yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely true because you know you need that level of empathy. Um, you need to empathize with the communities in order to bring them onto your side. Um, and yeah, empathy is something that and compassion. And being more collaborative. I mean, women are more collaborative, men are more competitive, naturally. But right. the, the issues of this world are so complex, especially within the conservation arena, that you need to have more collaboration and competition in order for, for us all to have a brighter future. And that's where it's important to have equal representation. <laughs> 100%, 100%. I think uh, well said. So, so I think that's all we have time for, but this, uh, this morning, this evening, for you in Africa, it's wonderful to have both of you panelists, uh, two Africans on this. This is really, really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Jerry, thank and you. We for all your host of you for yoga for the yoga retreats at Buindu. Yes, yes, I I am excited about that because it kind of goes hand in hand. <laughs> it's absolutely true that we should do something there with uh, in the nature. Um, and you know, Africa as a continent. You know, I've heard people who've gone there. You know, obviously, you guys live there. It's just an amazing, powerful land. The land is so grounding when you're there. When you walk the mm -hmm. land, you feel you go back in time. At least that, that was my experience. Um, you know, I've been to all those countries. I've been very fortunate. Uh, I, I think we should definitely pursue that, you know, yoga and conservation over there. So Jay, thanks again. Uh, congratulations yeah, right. on being a father. Congratulations on the great book. I look forward to getting a copy. And yeah, and <laughs> thank, we thank forward you. to keeping this going. So we're very proud of Jiva Mukti to be um, connecting the world through yoga and bringing these uh, topics you know, to the forefront. So uh, thanks everybody for watching and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You very much everybody. Yeah. Thank you Dr. Gladys for joining us, yeah. And have a nice weekend. Yeah, and thanks <laughs> to Caroline and Adri for organizing this. Uh, you've done a fantastic job as always. So see you, see you guys soon. And keep up the great work, everyone. <laughs> May the force always be with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need that. Thank you. Thank you.